We'll, st we'll try for now. Good morning. It's time to begin. Lee, you've just been tapped. Let's begin with a word of prayer. In this opportunity we have to gather together to study a portion of thy word, we pray, Father, that we put the thoughts and worries of the world far from us and concentrate upon Jesus Christ and the suffering and sacrifice he made for us. Be with us throughout this study. Help us concentrate. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name, amen. 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 All right, we are in chapter 16. And I'm going to go back to the beginning of chapter 16 because we started here last week and we had a question. And uh, I want to thank Angela again for pointing out the obvious. <clears throat> Um, at the end of the class, Joe asked if whether or not this was an adulterous relationship, and, and actually it's in verse 3 that we have the answer to that question. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. So, was it a case of, was it a case of adultery? Well, no, because she was his wife. And so what we have here is a case of plural wives. And to understand what's about to happen here uh, at the end of this, so he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. It's interesting because we have two dynamics going on here. The first dynamic is, is, that, is with Sarai and, and Hagar, who is her maid. Uh, she is the mistress of the house, as it were. But when she took Hagar and gave her to Abram to be his wife, it changed the dynamic a little bit because now she has a relationship directly with Abraham or with Abram. <clears throat> and in, in several cases in the Old Testament, we see it with Jacob and with Leah and Rachel. What happened when Jacob uh, and Leah, uh, Jacob and Leah got together uh, immediately, uh, Leah started producing children. And, uh, but who was the favored wife? Rachel was. And we saw it with Hannah and Elkanah and Penaniah. I think that's her name, right? Penaniah. Um, Penina? Penina. Penina, um, Penaniah. <laughs> um, who was the favored wife in that relationship? Hannah. And Hannah didn't have any children. And what did Penina do to Hannah? Made her life miserable because she had several children. And, 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 the, and often in a situation like this, and it's human nature, Abram had, uh, J Jacob had a favored wife. He liked Rachel more than he liked Leah. And when we get to it, you'll understand the situation there. Why? Because he fell in love with Rachel. He didn't fall in love with Leah. And he was tricked into marrying Leah. Um, we don't know the, the relationship between Elkanah and Penina, uh, whatever her name is, and Hannah. Uh, except that Hannah was the favored wife. And in fact, Elkanah said, am I not m more to you than, than any children? And so they had, a, they had a loving relationship. Now in this situation, Hagar is able to do something that Sarai cannot do, and that's bear children. Now in Hagar's mind, she's probably thinking to herself, I'm going to be number one now. I'm going to be top wife. Because there's always a primary wife in a situation where there are multiple spouses. There's always a favored wife. It's human nature. I mean, do you have a favored child? <laughs> I'm just kidding. We don't have favored children, do we? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, is that the thing is, is that you can try to treat your you can try to treat your wives equally. But I mean, even in, in the situation with Leah and Rachel, uh, remember the time when when uh, Reuben brought the mandrakes back in, and and uh, Rachel wanted the mandrakes, and she, and and so she traded sexual favors with her husband with Rachel. She traded her Rachel traded her time away uh, with her husband. 
uh, to Leah, and Leah ended up conceiving again. And the thing is, is that, uh, and, and so you, you have a dynamic. In fact, the law tells, the law says not to marry sisters. It tells a man not to marry sisters. Uh, and then maybe that comes out of Jacob. Um, but the thing is, is that uh, it's even worse when you have two women who are related to each other in this situation. And God says, don't even do that. Um, so we have a situation here that Hagar uh, starts to despise Sarai. But the problem is that Sarai, Sarai is still her mistress. And uh, that brings up a little bit of tension between her and Abram. Then Sarai said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. Whose idea was this in the first place? Sarai's. <laughs> Who's getting blamed for it? Abram. Um, you can go where you want to go with that in husband, <laughs> husband-wife relationships, but, um, you know, it's just, uh, this is uh, husband shaming here or whatever. I gave my maid to your embrace, and when she saw that she conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. Abram's kind of the innocent party here, if you will. Um, and so uh, Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring uh, on the way to Shur, and he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. And so here we have the, I mean, how harsh was Sarai with Hagar that she took the baby and she left? You know, um, and by the way, that's not a good thing either. Uh, Sarai's intention was is that that baby would be hers as well. But that's not the way it turned out here, apparently. So, um, again, this wasn't Abram's idea, but he gets the blame for it. Hagar becomes, uh, despises uh, Sarai. We've already pointed that out. Um, Abram reminds Sarai that Hagar is her maid, and she can do what she wants with her. And so she becomes harsh with her, and she flees. Uh, Bill. Yeah, the one thing I think where Abraham was perhaps wrong in this is that he should have told her no. You know, he, he, he's the head of the family. Just because she said, hey, here, take my handmaid, doesn't mean that he should have, not, that he had to. He made the decision to do that. So yeah. in some ways, I mean, it's proper, it's part of his wrong, his wrong right? He, uh, whether or not we interpret the promise before being through Sarai or, or through, um, uh, you know, her, Sarah's handmaid, Hagar. Hagar. Yeah, it's, it's like he could have decided not to. He was the head of the family. Right, and so, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> uh, again, the train of thought left the station. I wasn't on it. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, it's having a senior moment here. Um, the dynamic going on here, I mean, oh, the, the point I was going to make is, is that God has already three times told Abram that he's going to have descendants. And uh, they are not waiting on the Lord. If God told Abram that he was going to have descendants, <clears throat> and he has a wife, <clears throat> why, should he have, why should he go out and get more wives? Why shouldn't he have said, no, we will wait on the Lord? Uh, again, Abram's still growing in his faith, just like we grow in our faith every day. Um, but in this situation, uh, sometimes they call this the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm missing the word in my mind, but it's the, that they were trying to circumvent God's plan here on their own uh, instead of waiting for the Lord. And that's kind of the point. And as was pointed out last week, uh, Paul is going to use this situation in Galatians chapter 3, and I've got it in my notes later, um, to show uh, that the, the church is the true children, uh, Abraham's uh, true uh, seed of Abraham. So the angel of the Lord found her by a spring, and I'm going to go on to the next slide because, and then make some comments here. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself unto her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child. I'm sorry, I didn't realize. 
my mistake earlier. Uh, she took the child with her because it was still <laughs> with, with her. Behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael uh, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Ishmael literally means what? God hears, or and in fact, in fact, she's going to name this well uh, that uh, God sees. But um, Ishmael literally means God hears. And um, did God hear her in her uh, out in the wilderness? He did. Uh, it says, "Because the Lord has heard your affliction." Uh, was Sarai nice to Hagar? No. Was she being afflicted? Apparently so, harshly. And so she fled, and, and God calls her back and, and says, uh, says that. So um, why do you suppose that God sent her back to Sarai? Do you suppose she could survive in the desert on her own? Probably not. Is this child also going to be a child of promise in a way? Not a child of promise, but he's going to be a child of prominence. He's going to bless this child, and he's going to be a great man. Uh, uh, Ishmael. Yeah, he's a child of promise. He's, he's still a child of Abraham. Yeah. Uh, so, Flern, do you have a comment? The way I see that, uh, why the Lord uh, sent Harry back to uh, Sarai, he's saying that as a believer in uh, in 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 in, in let me get my thought together. That's okay. It's so, too early. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Another senior moment. Uh, <laughs> I think there is an application. The, I think there is an uh, application of the Scripture to our lives as Christians. I think the Lord is saying that if you have a problem, you don't run from it. You go back and correct it and face the truth and expect the help of our Lord Jesus Christ and adjust your attitude and learn from me. Actually, that's a great point, Ferento, because who caused the problem here? Hagar caused the problem by being puffed up and by despising Sarai in her eyes. Do you suppose if Hagar had been the dutiful maid and, and had, had uh, worked for Sarai the way she was supposed to, that this would have happened? Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of Hagar's fault here for getting in the situation she's in, that Sarai turns around and disciplines her for it. Um, uh, so you're, you're right, going back and accepting the responsibility for her actions. And, and afterwards, it doesn't sound like she was puffed up or just uh, despised Sarai in her eyes. Uh, Don, you have a comment? Yeah, that, doesn't this all boil down to um, the, 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 a choice, right? Because it, Islam traces their lineage to Ishmael, right? Uh, most likely, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So, and, and that's the Arabs. That's right. Arabia. That's Arabia, as opposed to Jerusalem, as it talks about in in sure. Galatians, right? Sure. Yeah. Although Islam at that point in time wasn't uh, wasn't around. Uh, Six hundred, seven hundred A.D. As a matter of fact. Correct. Yeah. So, um, does God have plans for Ishmael? Apparently, He does. And in order for those plans to come true, for, uh, uh, Gary Bill has a comment. Oh, does Terry have a comment? In order for those uh, plans to come fruition, uh, Ishmael and, and Hagar both have to live. Go ahead, Terry. You, you were starting on what I was going to say. Is, is I think there was something there that um, God wanted Abraham, I meant to get, I meant to, yeah, Abraham to give to uh, Ishmael. Because mm -hmm. for 13 years he was his son. 13 years he was trained. Well, and also in... in, in uh, in a little bit, um, Ishmael, as well as all the rest of Abraham's family, are going to be circumcised. He's going to have the sign of the covenant as well, uh, which is kind of an interesting thought if you think about it. Uh, Bill. You hear where, you, where Abraham says, behold, your maid is in your power, but it's not just her maid now, right? It's his wife, mm -hmm. which is, that, that makes it really kind of like, where is the, where's the more stronger relationship here? You're going to send my wife? away, you know, that it seems like he's also making a mistake there. I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, and because it's, it's still his child, <laughs> right? And his wife, right. 
Um, interesting here now, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, 9 through 12 here, three times it says angel of the Lord. Uh, in the prior verse it said angel of the Lord. Um, this is the first time uh, in Scripture that we see this particular phrase, angel of the Lord. Now we know that angel means what? Messenger, right? So literally messenger of the Lord. How many of your versions capitalize angel here? Why would they capitalize the word angel here when they say angel of the Lord? Because there's the, the translators and, and, and many believe that this is uh, some kind of either theophany, which is a physical representation of God, and we'll see that actually in, the, in uh, one of the next couple of chapters when the three men come to Abram, uh, but, uh, or this is a pre-incarnation appearance of Jesus Christ. Now, if you look at all of the different versions where it says the angel of the Lord, um, it's either, one of the best examples is the burning bush. When Moses sees the burning bush, he goes up to it, and God calls out to him from the bush, but it also says the angel of the Lord is there. So which is it? Is it God? who says, I am that I am, uh, you can call me I am, or is it the angel of the Lord, or is the angel of the Lord God, um, or is the angel of the Lord, again, a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament? Now, I personally believe that, uh, and, and Scripture will bear that up, uh, who does it say the rock was that followed them in the desert? Jesus Christ, right? Um, it's quite possible that it was Jesus Christ in the, in the pillar of fire and the, and the pillar of cloud in the desert. Um, now, was he Jesus Christ at that point in time? No, he was the Word of God. Um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, so in the Old Testament, uh, and, and again, Joshua, I think it's, I don't want to quote the chapter wrong, is it six? Uh, or four, I can't remember which chapter it is, when Joshua sees the commander of the army of the Lord and bows down to him and worships him, do we know that that's not an angel? Revelation, and, and twice in Revelation, an angel says, don't do that, I'm just a fellow servant, you can't worship me, worship God. Would an angel have accepted worship? Absolutely not. God accepts worship. So was the commander of the army of, the, of, the, uh, of God uh, uh, a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus Christ? I think so. Say again, Don? Something like that. So uh, when it says angel of the Lord here, that's not just an angel. When God comes, when, when the Father comes uh, with the two angels uh, in chapter 18, uh, it, doesn't, it, it, um, it doesn't call him an angel. He came with two angels. They weren't angels of the Lord in this respect. In this respect, this is something different. And the Bible makes a point of saying, and that's why the translators uh, capitalize that word angel there. And again, I don't know if it does that in your versions or not. This is the New King James. It does not in the New American. What does it say? Just angel of the Lord? Just, yeah, yeah, it's lowercase. Yeah, so it's interesting because it brings up a question, I think, um, whether or not this is... God in the flesh somehow. And can God take on human form? Absolutely he can, because again, chapter 18, right? Because he comes and he eats with Abram. And the angels come and they eat with Abram. In fact, uh, when, they go, when the angels go in chapter 19, they sit down and Lot, gives, Lot prepares them a feast. And I guess the assumption is that they, they eat it, because they ate in chapter 18 as well, the angels can take on human form and they can eat as well, which is a whole entire, they're spiritual beings. How do they do that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> God knows. Um, so um, I take this when it says it this way to be some kind of uh, incarnation, if you will, of God in human form, whether it's Jesus Christ or, the, or Jehovah himself coming to speak to this person, which again just totally boggles my mind that the God of heaven would, well, even would send an angel 
to speak to someone specifically. But in this case, I think one of the Godhead has come down to speak with Hagar himself, uh, which is just incredible to me. Um, so uh, take that for where you will, but he says, uh, he, he makes a promise about uh, Ishmael and sends him and sends her back. He says he's going to be a great nation. Uh, and is, um, are the descendants of Ishmael a great nation? Yeah, they control most of the world's oil supply right now. So yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, they're fabulously wealthy and a great nation. And they've been a fairly big nation the whole time. Uh, I mean, Bedouins, sure, but they've, uh, they are, uh, can, uh, if you look nowadays, this is certainly true. Have you ever seen the, the pictures of Dubai? Uh, there's the skyscrapers and stuff that they're building, the artificial islands that they're building, and all the stuff that they're doing. I mean, they're certainly a great nation now, uh, even if they've had rough times throughout, uh, throughout history. Um, then she called the name of the, uh, of the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees. For she said, what is, does your version have the, the Hebrew word there, Mike? In, uh, In verse uh, 13. Oh yeah, there it is. I have it in my home. I have it in my home. It's in the next verse. <laughs> yeah, beer lahoi roy, lahai roy. Uh, uh, therefore, the well is called beer lahai roy. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. Um, so, uh, she calls God the Lord. She calls him. You are the God who sees. Um, are there other names for God in the Bible? Tons and tons and tons. Um, uh, we, uh, I don't have it in my, uh, next, uh, in the next chapter, he's going to call himself God Almighty. That's another name for God, El Shaddai, right? And so here's, here's, uh, she says, you are the God who sees. Um, and so Hagar bore Abram a son and Abram named his, uh, his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Uh, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So, <clears throat> Hagar obviously goes back. Does she tell Abram about what happened to her? That she met God on the way? Must have said something because his name is Ishmael. And God told Hagar that. Hagar must have told Abram, or she got to name him. Um, but it says here that uh, uh, Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. So we have some, some uh, understanding that Hagar must have told Abram about what happened. Uh, and uh, Abram was 86 years old. Now, I do have this passage from Galatians here, and Paul makes a big point of this. You've got Hagar, um, and what, is it, what does Paul call Hagar here in this passage? The bondwoman. And who is Sarai? She's the free woman. And in Galatians chapter 4, I said, I said chapter 3 earlier, tell me, you who uh, desire to be under the law, uh, for do you not hear the law? For it was written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. We'll see that in, in, in future chapters, that, that God promised Isaac... And God comes through on his promise with Isaac. Um, but there's a difference here that he's making. Um, uh, he was born of the Bible, was born according to the flesh. He of the bond went through promise, which things are symbolic. So uh, Paul is using these two things to, uh, to, to say a message here. Uh, for the, uh, there are two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, because they're under the law. Jerusalem is under the law um, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. And that's talking about the church. And so Paul is trying to make a point here. He says, don't go back to the law because the law is bondage. And yet the church is, in the church we have freedom. And he's using this incident in Genesis to prove a very spiritual point. 
Don, you have a uh, comment? Yeah, it just struck me. You know, it says Abraham had two sons, but Ishmael was born not when he was Abraham, not, not, not when he had been given the new name. It was, he was still Abram, right? Which, which is another parallel point. You know, you can see that, that when he was Abram, he had, he had Ishmael, right? But mm -hmm. then he becomes Abraham, and has the, pro, the the son of promise, the child of promise. So, so, so the the child of the flesh was under his old name, his old, <laughs> the old stuff, right? And sure. the, and the child of promise is under the new. Anyway, that's just a little point there that I. Yeah, the, good point. An old point I just thought of. You know? No, thank you. <laughs> so, um, the child of promise is Isaac. That child hasn't come yet. That child's not going to come for a couple of chapters. Um, we're going to see we're going to see the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah first, and and then we'll see the birth of, of Isaac. Um, the problem the problem is is that these two tried uh, these three tried to circumvent God's plan for Abram and for Sarah. Um, they were not waiting on the Lord, um, and sometimes that that's really the lesson for us, right? That God has His own timetable. In fact, we'll see in in several situations that God's timetable. Um, is there for a reason, and, and he uses the timetable to, as, a, as a blessing. Did, did, um, did Elizabeth want a child earlier than she had one? No, she, wanted a, she and Zacharias wanted a child their whole lives, and yet God waited <laughs> until they were very old before he gave them a son. Uh, who would end up being John the Baptist. Was that a blessing for them to, to have a son in their old age? Certainly it was. Uh, yeah, that's what it says, yeah. Um, so uh, sometimes we rush ahead and we don't wait on the Lord when what we should be doing is waiting for God's timetable for us and not, uh, not our own. Uh, any th thoughts or comments before we go on to the next chapter? Uh, in chapter uh, 17, go ahead. Oh, Mike's got a comment. Go ahead. We, from what we see of the of the experiences of uh, Sarah and, and uh, Hagar at this point, it would almost uh, tend to cause us to to conclude that Hagar showed more faith than Sarah did, and that she uh, responded to what God told her to do and went back and and dwelt with Abram as she was commanded. Yeah, um, it's possible. You know, but I'm, I'm not saying that that yeah, ultimately gonna, bore out see. in her life, but, uh, you know, Sarai wasn't demonstrating any uh, measure of faith mm -hmm. uh, when she implemented the solution, quote unquote. The carnal plan for children yeah, is what yeah, it's called. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, and later on, we're going to see that, that uh, Hagar's faith is kind of rewarded again when God rescues her and Ishmael from the desert. Um, so, in chapter 17, I've got here the sign of the covenant. Um, we're going to uh, uh, we're going to see that Ishmael is a young man now, and that God is going to institute circumcision as the sign of the covenant. Uh, so, uh, this is kind of straightforward, uh, but it gives us a, it gives us a time marker here, right at the beginning of the chapter. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, "I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless." And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell down on his face and God talked to him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall be called Abraham for I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and, you will, and, and will make nations of you and kings will come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And also I give you and your descendants after you the land which you are stranger, all the land of Canaan and everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So is this the fifth time God has told Abram that he's going to give him descendants? And, and it's interesting do you think one child is fruitful? How many child? Actually, this is this is a trick question. But how many children does Abram have? Uh, is it ten or eight? 
I, I thought he had six by Keturah. Um, but he ends up having children after this, but he's, of course he's had Ishmael. He's going to have Isaac. Um, does that make him fruitful just having this, uh, you know, a few children like this? It's actually what happens after that that makes him fruitful, right? Not only that, Jesus Christ is going to come from his descendants, and that's going to make him very fruitful. Um, so um, anyway, he says, I am Almighty God. Um, you, you already pointed out what that means, and uh, we've, we've heard the phrase, El Shaddai. Um, he is God Almighty. Again, does Abram know what his name is, Jehovah? Does he know his name, Jehovah? The book of Exodus says, by my name, Jehovah, was I not known. I was not known to Abram. So even though it's using the word Lord here in the context of the study, um, it says the Lord appeared to Abram. That's Jehovah up there. Uh, Yahweh appeared to Abram. Um, The fact of the matter is, um, Abram doesn't know his name. He doesn't know him as Yahweh here. He knows him as God Almighty, or the Lord that sees, or the Lord that hears, or uh, any other name uh, that you can think of, the God of heaven and earth. We, we don't know all of the names that Abram knows God by, um, but he doesn't know him by Jehovah because Exodus tells us that. Um, so, he, I will make my covenant between me and you. Has he not already made a covenant between him and Abram? Yeah. He just did it in the, in the chapter before, right? Uh, the, the chapter before the chapter before, <laughs> uh, in chapter 15, uh, he made a covenant with him. And he's just, by saying this, he's just restating the obvious, uh, that I'm making my covenant with you. And now he's going, to, he's going to give them a sign of the covenant. But again, he says, um, no longer, and this is where he's renamed, no longer shall you be called Abram, so now I can re- breathe a sigh of relief because I can just say Abraham, Abraham, Abraham without having to think about saying Abram, because now he's Abraham, which means father of nations, right? Uh, It means uh, prince of nations. Uh, Let's see, what do I have in here? Um, I don't actually have it in here, but it means father or prince of nations. Uh, uh, Father, I believe. So, um, Abram, what does Abram do here? What we should all do when God speaks to us. Fall on our face. That's what he does here. It says in chapter, uh, chapter or verse 3, it says, Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, Did Abram interrupt God here at all? Did he try to talk? Job did the same thing, right? When Job was complaining about, uh, about God uh, to his friends and stuff, and in chapter 38, it says, And God answered, and the Lord answered him from the whirlwind. What did Job say? Absolutely nothing for a long time. Um, God started speaking to him. He says, where were you when I did this and this and this? And, and Job's, Job finally, when he did speak, speak, he said, I'm not worthy to talk to you. And Abram has the same, the same idea here. Now, it says that it says uh, the Lord appeared to Abram. Again, uh, was it in a vision? Was he, did he come and show himself somehow to, to Abram? It doesn't say. But um, there's some kind of appearance going on here. Um, and again, he renames him, and he's, he promises to make him fruitful. And in verse 8, it says, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, I, and I will be their God. Um, and then we, uh, it calls him the father of many nations, and this can kind of give you a clue of that. Um, we have Abram and his three wives. He had three wives. Uh, the first was Sarah, of course, and out of Sarah came Isaac, and then out of Isaac and Rebekah came Esau and Jacob. Out of Esau, uh, through, through uh, th- his three wives, you, you see all the, the different princes of Esau. Then you see all the children of, of Jacob. But Ishmael also had children, uh, 12? Yeah, 12 princes. And Keturah had two, four, six, six kids. Uh, Keturah had six kids, and, and if you look there, uh, one of Keturah's kids is Midian. Do we ever see Midian show, uh, show up as a nation? We do. Uh, one of the kids of uh, Esau is uh, his great-grandson is Amalek. Do we see the Amalekites anywhere? Uh, we do. Um, uh, we see also, of course, the children of Israel, 
uh, up there um, do we see, actually they're not his descendants, but we see Moab and Ammon. Uh, they're going to come later on in chapter 19. Uh, but there are different nations that we recognize out of, out of all of these guys, uh, but that doesn't mean that they weren't nations in themselves. Um, do you have a comment, Florento? descendants that, uh, I mean, through her, through his lover, the concubine, Keturah. Um, his, she was his wife uh, as well. Um, after Sarai dies, later on, he marries Keturah. It's, it says that in the text. Um, what, what, was your, what was your question, though? Yeah, yeah, yes, that, that's the answer I was trying to see. Okay. Okay. Um, Bill and then Mike. Uh, verse 8 here, uh, an everlasting possession. Are you going to comment on, I mean, does that mean forever? Uh, it, it does accept, right? Um, is it age-lasting? Because there's different forevers and eternal and age-lasting, different words used. I'm not sure what, what that one is. but um, I don't know that I'm fully ready to talk yeah. But I mean, you, um, Gary uh, Terry has a question uh, after after or before Mike. But let's let's address that for a second because do they own? Well, they own the land now, <laughs> right? Um, but did they own the land for uh, close to a thousand years? No, they didn't. Um, I think I think you're probably close to it when you're saying age lasting. Uh, the, they owned it all the way up until uh, the time of the church, until 70 A.D., when they were taken out of the land. Most of them were taken out of the land. Um, but there's also going to be, in Deuteronomy, we'll see that, that God puts limitations on this, right? You get to keep it as long as you're faithful. And they weren't faithful, right? Yeah, so that's the way I was thinking is this, that even though he's saying it here, it doesn't sound like it's conditional. He makes it conditional later on. Um, that's, the best, that's the only way I could answer that. Terry, you had a comment? Oh, I, I had read here in Genesis not too long ago that um, Abraham sent each one of Couture's children out with blessings. He did, and, and he also he also sends them away. Sends uh, them away, and he sends Isaac them away. stayed with him. Right, uh, good point, uh, Mike. We'll get to that later on. It's it's after Isaac is born. Uh, this is just a point of clarification. Were you saying that Moab and Ammon were also? No, part? I I, I, okay. I I tried to make that clear when I was saying we, we see them as nations. They're not descendants of Abraham. Yeah, um, and they, but and they'll never close. and and God says they'll never be admitted into His uh, assemblies and everything. He did say that, but yeah. there's a reason why He said that, right? Yeah. Uh, not because of how they were born or conceived. It's how they treated Israel when they came up out of Egypt and didn't want to let them pass through. Did God ever make exceptions to that, by the way? He did. Uh, Ruth is an exception to that. Um, because she was, she was uh, according to the law, a descendant of a Moabite to the 10th generation, I believe, was not to be allowed into the assembly, and yet David obviously was allowed to be in the assembly. So he made exceptions to that. <clears throat> uh, just to, this just is to point out, uh, God keeps his promises. There's a lot of people here. A lot of people in the world today owe their, their ascendancy to physically today. Now, how many people spiritually owe their, their, uh, their lineage to Abraham? Every believer does, right? Every, uh, and again, Galatians makes that clear, and I believe Romans makes that clear, that we're the children of Abraham because we're the children of faith. We're the children of promise. So uh, just something to keep in mind. Yes, Lorento. I just want to clarify. Yeah? The word, walk before me and be blameless. How could me, for example, become blameless? How is, how is that word blameless applied to me? Am I... Uh, is the Lord saying... Be blameless in front of, I mean, 
in the eyes of people or be, blamele be blameless uh, before me? How is it applied? Well, um, where I would go would be to uh, 1 Timothy uh, when it talks about the qualifications for elders. What is an elder supposed to be? Blameless. Now, do you suppose that, that one of the three of us never sin? Um, I, I, I hope you don't suppose that because it's not true, right? Um, so what is the quality of blameless that we're talking about here? Are we talking sinless? No, we're not. It's not. So th that's the first thing I want to get to, is that blameless does not equal sinless. Um, but does that mean that you can walk in a way that glorifies God and that no one can accuse you of? I think that's what it comes down to, is, is that no one accuses you of wrong. Go ahead. And so, therefore, if I would apply the blameless, if, if the Lord says to me, learn to be blameless, uh, is the Lord saying, have some integrity? Is that what it's saying to me? I think so. I mean, obviously, obviously, again, going back to uh, the qualifications for an elder, I don't think that we think that elders are sinless. Um, but it means that they, they hold themselves to a higher standard, perhaps. Um, that they're trying to do what God wants them to do and be the way God wants them to be. And that's what God is asking Abram to do. He's not saying don't go, go out and don't sin. He's saying walk in integrity. I think integrity is a great word here. Walk in faith. Walk in faith. Yeah. Well, and that's what he's asking Abraham to do. To walk before me, right? And, uh, and, and, don't, you know, don't go other, after other gods. Don't do, you know, he's, he's asking him to walk in integrity. I think that's a good word. My, my concern was simply because of the wording before that, where the Lord says, walk before me. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that indicates that the Lord is telling me uh, to be an open display uh, of, uh, uh, of the Lord uh, in front of people. Sure. And so, and so when the Lord again said, be blameless to me, I, think, I believe that he is asking me to have integrity. Sure. I, I don't disagree with that. I think that's a great, uh, a great way of looking at it. Uh, any other thoughts there? Um, let's go on. Uh, now, God is going to say, God is going to um, institute circumcision here. Uh, and he says, and God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout your, their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall circumcise in the flesh of your foreskins. Uh, it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be with, uh, my covenant shall be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. And, circum, un, and the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And so it's interesting, I, I find it interesting here, that God is giving Abram and his descendants a physical sign of being in covenant with God. Um, and it's interesting because even though it's an outward sign, one would hope that it's not an outward sign. Uh, it, it's, it's a hidden outward sign, in other words, because you're not supposed to be exposing your nakedness to anyone. Uh, and so here you are circumcised at eight days old. Uh, Abram and his men are about to be circumcised here. Um, and we see that Levi and Simeon talk the, the men of, it's not Shiloh, it's, um, what is it, Don? The, 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 the Shechem, thank you. Uh, the men of Shechem to, uh, to circumcise themselves and then go in when they're in pain and kill them all. Um, the, the, the point is, is that God is saying, this is going to be a sign. And did the Jews, did the Jews follow this sign? Religiously, actually, right? Um, uh, to a point where, 
to a point where um, it becomes a problem in the church, where Jews want to enforce circumcision as a sign of the covenant uh, on Gentiles. And um, uh, I think you could maybe just give them the benefit of the doubt and understand that, but uh, Paul obviously makes uh, a, a, a good argument saying that their logic is flawed, and that's, it's circumcision of what that we're really interested in? The heart, right? And, and again, something that's not visible. Um, but, uh, and by the way, they did have problems with that at times in their lives. Um, sometimes they would ask them to lift their robes to determine whether they were Jews or not. Now, is that something you can take back, by the way? It's interesting that the circumcision of the flesh is something you can't, I guess you can surgically undo it. I, 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 I <laughs> yeah. There was a time in which, under the Hellenistic age, it was something that was very common, yeah. common to be done. I mean, it was something that was being done. Quite, quite and, and do you know why? Because of things like gymnasiums. Because did they, did they have exercise clothes when they were in their gymnasiums? No, actually, the point is, is that they didn't wear clothes when they were, in their, when they were doing their exercising and stuff, and, and that they were naked. Um, and it was obvious at that point that you were a Jew. Um, so um, uh, Mike makes a good point there. Um, but the thing is, is that these, God gives this as an outward sign. And um, who does it? Who, uh, who, who's gonna, who's, does Abraham do this? Absolutely. He takes him and I, or Ishmael and all of his people, and, and he goes ahead and does it. And it says it in the next, it says, Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her, her, her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give her a son by her. Uh, then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall uh, come from her. Uh, Sarai, uh, Sarah means princess. Sarai actually means princess too, but um, he's changing her name uh, formally here. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael may live before you. And so uh, Abraham, Abraham here is going to laugh at God. <laughs> actually, he's not laughing at God, is he? Um, what kind of laugh is this? Because it's going to make a, it's going to make a difference. This is a oh if only kind of a laugh. You know, that would be great, God. That'd be really good. But I'm old. Sarah is old. Can't Ishmael be the one who walks before you? And God's going to say, no, that's not the way I want it. So uh, he asks that Ishmael walk before him. And God says, uh, then God said to him, no, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac, which means what? laughter. <laughs> Not only is Abraham going to laugh, but later on Sarah's going to laugh. And so God says, you're going to call his name laughter. Um, it'd be like naming your daughter Joy, right? Um, so I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. As, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this, at this set time next year. Then he finished talking with him and, uh, and God went up from Abram. And so we see, uh, we see this, uh, this chart here. Why is that not going forward? There we go. Uh, a big, uh, we see the 12 sons of, of uh, uh, Ishmael, and we see the, we actually see the, the children of, of Keturah, and, and we would call them Arabs today. And so um, he fulfills his promise uh, to Abram. That's actually the end. Well, actually, it's not quite the end of this chapter, so we'll have to finish it up But when they actually do the circumcision. Um, but uh, thank you for your time, and we'll make it into chapter 18 next time.